What's up? This is Kofi Outlaw. How you doing, Comic Book Nation? We're coming to you live from Comic Con 2019, and we're here with two of the, I dare say, iconic stars of the Dragon Ball franchise, Mr. Sean Chamel, Miss Monaco Real. How are you guys doing? I'm good. Great. I'm good. It's actually Shemmel, and also Shemmel, it, that's so okay. Sorry. No, it's okay. And is uh, is okay. your last name really outlaw? Like yeah, your parents? I didn't invent that for like an. You did not invent that. No. Your last name. That's really your, my yeah. Your last name. Yeah. So does like, that get you in trouble when you're like you sign something at the bank or you sign something? <laughs> Funny enough, it's very good in bars, very bad for like traffic stops. Yeah, that's about how it kind of plays. Do you out. just go? Yeah. I can't help it. It's my last name, officer. Well, they always like think because it's my last name. They're like, so do you think you're an outlaw? Is always the question is that I get. What do you think? Punk. And I'm like, <laughs> and it's always kind of like split. It's like if I answer the question and I'm very submissive, like, no, sir, that's just very bad. Like, I got to kind of live up well, to I'm it. Jealous. I just shrug now. Yeah, yeah, that's all you can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that last name a lot. That's awesome. <laughs> so, talking about me, let's talk about you Sorry. guys, because that's what people are actually here for. <laughs> We're here to talk about a lot of things Dragon Ball. I mean, there's, I mean, this is like the year for Dragon Ball. We're here celebrating the 30th anniversary, 30th anniversary yeah. of Dragon Ball Z. But you know, in addition to that, you guys just took a moment and aside to just break a world record yesterday yeah. with the largest did, Kamehameha ever. Well, I didn't know if we were breaking or establishing. Establishing? Because well, I didn't know if it had been done. They didn't inform me if we were breaking some other person and group of people who had had done a Kamehameha. I just imagine there has to be some kind of competitive mass Kamehameha. Oh, well, I've already uh, seen it groups. online. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, somebody's going to break the record, I'm sure, at some point. But then I'm gonna have to do it we'll again. Just break it keep again. breaking again. Break just it like again. Dragon Ball just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You so know. my first question, Sean, for you who has had to deliver some of the most epic Kamehamehas that like really touch and inspire fans over many years, how was it to get like that energy back from the crowd, from it hundreds was, of people for once? Well, it was really weird because I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm used to doing stuff in public, but once once we got everybody charged up and we were synchronous, it was a pretty. Um, it, on the camera, it doesn't sound quite as loud as it did when we were there because we had some sound issues, but being in the middle of it all uh, was really like, you could really feel the energy of the crowd and I was like really surprised. I was I was almost teared up a little bit. I was like, whoa, this is like a really a big thing. Like, I, I, I you know, and then my agent texts me, she says, you're trending on Twitter. I'm like, what does that mean? And, which is weird because I, you know, I used to build computers. I, I grew up in the tech era. I just don't give a shit about social media because uh, it, it's so loaded with, uh, with <laughs> so many other things I don't yeah. like about social media, as we all don't. So, um, uh, so I didn't pay attention to like what trending means. Like I don't know if trending means a million people saw it or five million people saw it or it two lot. people a lot. a lot. So my agent sending me stuff, my girlfriend sending me stuff. Like you're trending. I'm like, is that good? And like, yes. I'm like, wow. So I, I guess that's a big deal. I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> How are you guys taking it in this year? Let's start with Monica. I mean, just. From the 30th anniversary of Dragon Ball C to see how the franchise and anime as a genre is just exploding. I mean, just its presence at this con this year alone. You guys have been in the industry kind of grinding out for this particular genre for so many decades. Right. Um, mm -hmm. How are you guys enjoying it this year to finally kind of see this mainstream breakthrough? It's so awesome and yet so overwhelming you know because when we started it's like we're just little voice actors we go into a closet nobody yeah. knows who we are like the anonymity is great and all of a sudden that anonymity is kind of gone, gone. Oh, yeah. yeah i get recognized a lot yes. a lot well his hair especially well the hair well yeah i, I think glorious. it might be the hair in the glasses i don't know but it's a lot yeah, and I've noticed that even though I change my hair like every two weeks, I've noticed I've started to get more people in public like, hey, or people go, Bulma! Yeah. Hi, the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> this is awkward. But at the same time, it is really rewarding because we've spent so much of our lives in anime and working on anime yeah. and telling people how awesome anime is only to finally years later have people listen. And yeah. Go, oh, you know what? So it's kind of a dumb cool. moment. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, welcome to the club. We were anime when anime wasn't cool. We're like the you know? <laughs> Back when people were still calling it Japanimation. Oh, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Days. Yeah. yeah, that's where I jumped in. Um, <laughs> funny funny enough, this is my 20th anniversary on the show, so it's yeah. kind of it's, uh, auspicious for myself because it's 30th and the 20th and and, and when I, I look at it going oh my god if there's another 20th anniversary I'll be 70 by then so and Moscow does I was 82 so I got to <laughs> keep up with her and she's still kicking ass so I, I feel a little competition from Japan <laughs> yeah I mean <laughs> so. it's crazy I just think about how you guys just growing up the original Dragon Ball Z came on it changed my life and so did Curse of the Blood Rubies that movie oh, yeah. that I got mm. on a little tape when I was a little kid and yeah. didn't even get the end of but it was like so obsessed with and to see this all grow and just see like now the success of something like Dragon Ball Super Broly and coming award like even in the US holding down the domestic box office yeah. and ranking in the top five is pretty incredible. 
what do you guys, if I can just pick your brain over your time now that we're celebrating 30 years, let's talk about some of the moments that you look back now and have changed for you from doing Dragon Ball Z, maybe have changed to become your favorite moments that you didn't necessarily have before. Wow. You know, I will say that it's been really, really fun that the more popular it gets and the more um, visible it is, the yeah. more people. It used to be back in the day that, uh, you know, you'd say, I'm working on this show and you'd have yeah. to explain the premise and everything. <laughs> now it's to a point where I can say, well, I'm, I'm Bulma and Dragon Ball and it doesn't matter who it is. They're like, <gasps> Dragon Ball. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And that is a weird new sensation that has only happened, I'd say, probably in like the last seven years yeah, or so that yeah. people are it's that identifiable um, and to me that's one of my favorite moments is that I don't have to explain to everybody what it is anymore because explaining I the plot that. of Dragon Ball in a very short period of yeah. time is very difficult it's very I, <laughs> yeah I try to do it for a living and it, and it takes more than 200 words yeah, or a tweet to, yeah to for sure the yeah. plot of Dragon Ball <laughs> uh, right now we're kind of in this pause for the franchise and a lot of fans are just hungry for what's coming next. The show's coming back! No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Not, I, I, Run that no, headline. No. It's not. Uh, I have no idea, actually. They never tell me anything because I'll do that. Well, no. we're the last to know for no, that. This is all hypothetical. We're, this isn't, we're, not, we're not trying to get spoilers. This is all hypothetical. We talk a lot, you know, internally in the office about how big the franchise is growing and whether it's becoming so big, whether it can kind of expand out into things like more spin-offs and character spin-offs for each characters. And my question is, do you think that's something that's feasible for this particular franchise? Or do you think you need, like, could you have a Goku franchise and a Vegeta series kind of well, running? I or mean, do you think you need them all together collectively? Well, I, think, I mean, I can answer that kind of tangentially because we, we have these discussions as well. Um, and, uh, and I think it's part of the, uh, the focus and goal of, of, of the people who make Dragon Ball. Um, they want it to be a, a worldwide dominating brand, and, and, and I think in order to be a worldwide dom dominating brand uh, with a, a world creation, you have to have a, a very large universe, a very rich universe with a lot of characters and a lot of story, and Dragon Ball has all those elements. So I'm surprised there's not Dragon Ball theme parks everywhere, mm -hmm. there's there's not, and, and there's more to come. I mean, I think there will be some, it's like something like that in the future, I'm only speculating, but like I'm thinking of things not just show-wise, but just like... You know, they have a Harry Potter world. Why can't we have a Dragon Ball world? Like, there's there's enough there for us to do that. Why aren't we doing geocaching Dragon Ball hunts or something? <laughs> that would be fun, you know, or whatever. But as far as new spinoffs and, and stuff, Chris was talking about how he wanted that manga about Yamcha, that where he he gets re resurrected and he's he he knows what's going to happen in Dragon Ball. Yeah. It's all told Dragon Ball from Yamcha's perspective. I'd love to see that in an anime. You could have. Um, I know Jocko's got his own. Yeah, Jocko's got his own art. And Bulma could definitely have her own show, her own talk show with a glass Ooh. of wine. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Every time I text Chris, it translates. Uh, it translates Goku and Vegeta as G O space C O O and the Vegeta. <laughs> and so I want to make a cop show called Goku and the Vegeta. And it's just Go. It's like not actually Goku. It's like a parody, but it's like it'll and it's the Vegeta. And the Vegeta's like you know, it's kind of like Eddie Murphy and. Uh, uh, Nick Nolte in 48 Hours, kind of, you know? And so, like, a buddy cop buddy show buddy. like that, I would like to see a spin-off buddy cop show with Goku and Vegeta. Funny enough, the manga's kind of, like, setting the stage for that not mm -hmm. to be something impossible. Are you guys following? Do you follow the manga? Do you follow the current, current like, Moro I, arc? I try to stay... I, well, for, I have a weird issue with language. I don't trust translations. So <laughs> Good policy. Viz does a great job, and that's how we get the manga, but then I'm thinking, but is this what it really means? And what if I took it to a different translation? And then I get married to it. And then when we have our translation and our, I, I get uncomfortable in the recording sessions. So I'm waiting for it to all be done. So I don't read ahead. Just, I stay in the dark right. on purpose. Also because Goku doesn't know ahead. So I want to keep it fresh. If I already know what's coming, it might affect my performance. So I try to keep like, it stay in, I don't even know what happens at the end of Super. I, I stay current with the episode I'm working on, on purpose. I think a lot of us choose not to read the manga for those reasons. Yeah. Like you don't want to get attached to something that's in the manga that might not show up in the anime, uh, or you don't want to foreshadow. Like, yeah. cause if we do, if we know what's coming, then even though we don't mean to, sometimes in our reads and in our, in our scenes together, we might accidentally put some subtext in there. Yeah. And so it's sometimes better to just Find out when the character finds, finds out. out. Yeah. yeah, so we don't uh, we don't go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys translations? I mean, the Dragon Ball fans are really critical of translations. They are, yeah. Have you guys ever had to stand in the booth and, and take like a hard stand on a translation or I, a line? I do a lot because what'll ha especially because. Uh, back in the early days of Funimation, they were really heavily adapting the scripts for American audiences. And then when we got to Kai, they were like, let's just do this pure Japanese. And then that's when I really fell in love with the show. And I'm like, oh, it's pure. 
Now I understand the power of it. And so as I, when I steward this character and play the character right, and, and with all due respect to all the fans out there, and I love them all, I'm only concerned about making one person happy, and that's Akira Toriyama-sensei. So if he if he came out and said, Sean, you suck at it, well, then I'm like, I gotta change it. But he's like, you're great at it. Well, he's never gonna say that. But um, <laughs> uh, so I, uh, uh, actually, I lost my train of thought. Uh, what were we, what were we, <laughs> sorry, I do that a lot. Sorry, sorry, Balma. <laughs> It's okay, I'm used to it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> what was I talking about? I was getting to a point. Um, we, we, were, we were talking about the, what was I talking translations, about? Translations, if you, oh, translations. you stand up, So, yeah. on Kai and on Super, um, especially when you know a character, and I'm only allowed to do this because my producer allows it, otherwise he would counterman me, but um, I'll see a line that looks out of character or not canonical because the adapter has added some flavor or meaning to it that to me is inconsistent with the set of rules I have for playing Goku, which are based on as pure Japanese as possible. Um, and so I will take a hard stance. There was one, I, I do it, I do it, I'll do it like one or two lines an episode where it'll look like something Goku's being very egoic or like very Vegeta-like. And I'm like, no, he's pure of heart. He, he, he doesn't go, we're gonna show them who's number one. Like there was a scene where they had written that in, he's talking to Goten. I'm like, cause he had his finger up. And I looked at the original translation, he doesn't say that at all. And I'm like, he would not go, we're gonna go pwn these guys just cause we can't, cause we, he's not like that, you know? So I, I will take a hard stance on that. And I'm allowed to do that. I mean, if my producer is like, no, you, you gotta do it, then I have to. But he, my producer is very supportive of me trying to play this character as as purely as, as possible. And so. I think that's true, like, because we've all worked together for such a long time, we have a really good working relationship. Yeah. So we're allowed to voice like, hey, cause I know like with, for me, a lot of times, you know, the adapters are male and they're all wonderful. I can always tell when but, men, are, I mean, yeah, I can always you tell. Can yeah. tell when a man is <laughs> writing for a lady. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll be like, hey, can we take that and maybe say this instead because that's how a lady would approach it. So it's really great that everybody that works on the show is able to work together. So it's not, it's more of a team effort than yeah. just one person sitting at the helm going, you do this and you do that, which is a really unique and cool experience. Yeah, I yeah, think. we're allowed, yeah. the fact that we're, you know, Justin Cook is our, our guy who kind of makes these decisions and he's also Raditz on the show. And he's a really, really good supporter of artists and supporter of art instead of just like, being counter, get it done, you know, which some producers can be like that. Um, but l we're lucky that, you know, we have a guy who's a, you know, an artist himself and an actor himself. And that makes our working environment uh, really, really satisfying, I think. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, Mike? I agree. <laughs> and just to wrap up, after a year like this, what are you guys excited for in the, in the upcoming Ooh, near future? Well, Kakarot's coming out uh, early, early 2020, which is you can play in Kakarot, you, it's an RPG, you can play the entire Dragon Ball Z saga all the way through the Boo Saga from beginning to end is an RPG. So that, you, there, there's a playable demo down at the Dragon Ball world right now. Oh, cool. Um, and we don't know what we're excited about. <laughs> we don't know what's coming out, but I know that there was, they, they uh, the, Japan had te teased two to three years from now, perhaps another movie, I don't know. But that's, that's you know, strong internet rumor is all I've got for you. There's an <laughs> energy, there's like a buzz yes. in the air and like we feel it and it's tangible and we're like, okay. We do know, we're they, excited. I know that they wanna do more. I yeah. do know that. I do know that they're not gonna go, well, we're done with Dragon Ball, close up shop. I can't even <laughs> see that happening before I'm dead. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm excited for whatever they throw at me, you know? They, they call me, I'll put on the orange chute or the kicks yeah. or, or whatever, <laughs> whatever we're gonna do, so. All right, well, thank you guys very much for coming by and enjoy your con and just relish for all the I'm hard work and 30 years of uh, Dragon Ball Z. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Outlaw. Thank you. <laughs> That'll do it for this interview, but we have much more for you from comicbook.com at Comic-Con. Be sure to tune in. I'm Kofi Outlaw.